The term citizen science refers to research that is conducted by or with individual or groups of non-scientists. The tradition of amateur scientists, of people who are not professionals in the fields that they're researching, is a rich tradition, and countless important discoveries have been made by people who follow other callings, but for whom experimentation and discovery has been a hobby, something that they've done on the side. And fields as diverse as astronomy, ornithology, oceanography, art history, computer science, seismology, and even pharmaceutical research have benefited from the efforts of non-professionals over the years. Before the 20th century, a great deal of groundbreaking research, and a great deal of tedious, not sexy, but still vital research, was done by so-called gentlemen scientists, a group that, importantly, also included numerous women, and which almost exclusively referred to wealthy people who could self-fund their research. There were still discoveries being made within individual trades, bakers slowly but surely iterating their craft, figuring out the designs for better ovens, the better recipes for their bread, and so on. But many of the non-practical, theoretical discoveries and ideas were posited by people who could afford not to work, or who could afford to take the time outside of work to think about such things, and who could afford things like books and expensive tutelage and high-end equipment, and who could afford trips to exotic places and to pay the bills while they visited knowledgeable people around the world, or while they sat for years with their noses in books or on the sky or on the world around them. In the 19th century, scientific methodology was systematized which is what allowed for the modern scientific process, with variables and control groups and the replication of research. And the term scientist was coined by a priest, philosopher, and polymath named William Wewell during that same period. In the 20th century, on the back of that systematized methodology and the demonstrated benefits of investing in knowledge, professional scientists became more of a common thing. More funding was granted by governments to invest in such people and their efforts, and a great deal more was invested by companies, which were evolving into modern corporations. And as they evolved, they came to invest increasing amounts of money and resources into research and development. Amateur scientists continued to work on their craft in the background, though. Empowered by many of these same tools and other developments, the cost of research decreased with each new generation, and the available methods of conducting said research also improved. This space really took off, though, with the dawn of modern manufacturing techniques and materials, like plastics, and then again with the invention of the internet. Plastics allowed for the cheap, large-scale production of tools like telescopes and microscopes and test slides, while the internet and all of the inventions that made it possible allowed folks with shared interests from around the world to join their efforts into a unified whole, accomplishing far more as a group than any one individual far-flung person could have hoped to achieve in isolation. What that meant was that for the cost of setting up a website, these amateur groups could have thousands of people watching the sky, listening to radio signals, tracking the weather, and measuring ground rumbles for earthquakes, simultaneously around the world, using technologies not terribly different from what the pros were using. Though the pros were often operating with far fewer people involved, and their costs of operation were often a thousand times higher. Of course, there's still plenty that can only really be accomplished with budgets measured in the millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, and with equipment that's only available to universities and research labs, giant corporations and governments. We are not yet at the point in our scientific and manufacturing development that we can build tiny particle accelerators for anyone who wants one. I mean, give it time, but we are definitely not there yet. But this parallel track running alongside the mainstream, professional, 
scientific community has added a great deal to our species' understanding of the world, and when need be, they can be tapped by the professional scientific community to participate in larger, better-funded research. And this is possible because of the connections allowed by the internet, the cheapness of the tools required, and because of the modern methodologies that allow scientists to give these citizen scientists a checklist of duties and instructions for how to operate the equipment. And this collection of human nodes can then work together as a greater whole, a sprawling science system capable of some truly impressive things. Today, I would like to talk about one particular facet of citizen scientific research, the burgeoning world of personal genomics, and how a consumer-grade product marketed as a type of citizen science equipment is being used to reopen and investigate cold cases with some pretty staggering results. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent listener-supported show. If you are enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. Also super helpful is leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts, or you might consider picking up one of the books that I've written. You can find a complete list of those at colin.io. And one more quick note, I will be going on tour in the United States and Canada. If you're keen to come out and say hello and to see me speak in person, you can find tour locations and dates at becomingtour.com. All right, let's get back to the show. The article I want to start with today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, The Golden State Killer is Tracked Through a Thicket of DNA, and Experts Shudder. Now just a quick heads up, there is some very light, non-graphic discussion of murder and sexual assault in this episode, which, even if non-graphic, are still not pleasant topics. So that said, this is a story with a lot of compelling, newsworthy facets to it. Among them is the series of crimes that took place in California from 1974 through 1986, and which are loosely organized into three major crime sprees during that time. Over the course of those crime sprees, the man who became known as the Golden State Killer committed at least 12 murders, more than 50 rapes, and over 100 burglaries in the state. Enough crimes that for a long time, they were attributed to different people with different monikers. It wasn't assumed that one person would be so prolific and keep going for so long without ever being caught. Those other monikers, by the way, were equally evocative. He was at times called the East Area Rapist, the Original Night Stalker, the Vesalia Ransacker, the Dolner Street Prowler, and the Diamond Knot Killer in reference to an unusual knot that he would use while tying up some of his victims. In addition to his criminal prolificness, the Golden State Killer was known for toying with police and toying with his victims in very cruel and psychologically damaging ways. In the late 70s, he left notes for police after evading them several times. One of these notes was a poem entitled Excitement's Crave, which he sent to the editor of the Sacramento Bee newspaper, the Sacramento mayor's office, and a local TV station. This poem was sent in after the killer alerted the police by telephone that he would strike somewhere on Watt Avenue that night, and after he then evaded them, despite having given them that warning. A year later, a series of homework pages on General Custer were discovered near the scene of an attack, along with a journal-style writing about how humiliating the author had found being forced to write that report by his teacher. Also included in these pages was a hand-drawn map of a suburban neighborhood with the word punishment written on the back. None of these pieces were conclusively proven to have been produced by the killer, nor were the phone calls that were received by the police that followed the killer's pattern and which contained information only he would know, but most are assumed to be his work. There's enough 
circumstantial evidence to lump them in with his larger body of work. Some of the calls that he made might be considered brags or taunts, while others made to some of his rape victims took the form of menacing greetings. One that was received by a victim on December 9th, 1977, for instance, simply said, Merry Christmas, it's me again. While another, to a different victim, included threats. He called her horrible names and said over and over and over again that he was going to kill her. Serial killers, regardless of what might be portrayed on TV, are actually quite rare. And that's part of why they're so often worked into our fiction. They are strange and unusual and compelling in a terrifying way. The generally accepted definition of a serial killer is someone who kills three or more people over the course of more than a month, and generally in the service of some kind of abnormal psychological gratification. They do it because they are compelled to. They can't not, in a way. Though that last bit is obviously a lot less quantifiable than the characteristics that require only numbers to assess. So the definition here is a little bit fuzzy at times. It's estimated by the FBI that only about 1% of all murders perpetrated in the U.S. each year are committed by serial killers. And that means that of the around 15,000 murders committed in the U.S. annually, only about 150 can be attributed to repeat killers of this variety. Murderers who kill multiple people over time, usually because their minds work differently than most people's minds, and for a multitude of possible reasons. So that, all by itself, already makes this story unusual. This particular rapist, serial killer, and burglar was prolific and was successful over a very long period of time. But his propensity for the dramatic to call his victims and police to intentionally leave evidence behind, little notes, explanations for his behavior, brags and threats, that made him somewhat theatrical, in addition to being terrifying and strange. But this particular story was recently inflated in scope due to the attention of a true crime author named Michelle McNamara, who, among other things, ran the website True Crime Diary, where she wrote about her research into true crime stories and discussed topics like using social media and other online resources to look into cold cases that were considered to be unsolvable before these tools had become available. In 2013 and 2014, McNamara became interested in the Golden State Killer case when she learned that newly available DNA evidence had linked the original Night Stalker and the East Area Rapist, showing that they, and those other monikers I mentioned before, were in fact the same person. The same wildly active criminal who could now be tracked, his movements mapped, based on where his crimes took place. It was actually McNamara who coined the name Golden State Killer as she began to look into these newly linked cases. And it was around that time that she began working on a book entitled I'll Be Gone in the Dark, One Woman's Obsessive Search for the Golden State Killer, which was published posthumously as McNamara died in her sleep in 2016 from an undiagnosed heart condition. Her book, which was unfinished at the time of her death, was updated and then finished by another true crime writer named Paul Haynes and McNamara's husband, the comedian and actor Patton Oswald. Those original articles written by McNamara back in 2013 and 2014 and the bits of DNA evidence that had linked the crimes that were the focus of those articles led to a resurgence in interest for the case leading to a $50,000 reward being offered up by local law enforcement agencies in the FBI for the capture of the Golden State Killer. McNamara's book was released in February of 2018, two years after her death. It became a nationwide bestseller. Two months after the book's release, on April 25th of 2018, authorities announced the arrest of a 72-year-old man named Joseph James D'Angelo. D'Angelo was a former cop, a mechanic, and a father of three. He was also, allegedly, the Golden State Killer. And this is where this story takes another strange turn, because D'Angelo was identified and tracked down in a very unusual, innovative way. And the method used to find him 
and rule out other suspects is the final, main, newsworthy characteristic of this story. It's important to note, I think, that the professionals involved in this case, the cops and the FBI, and everyone else, they were not bumbling idiots. Just as serial killers are perceived to be far more common than they are, because being rare and strange, they are portrayed with a great deal of frequency on TV shows and movies and such, but just like that gives us a false sense of how common they are, so too is it unusual to have a case this big, ruined by the idiocy of preternaturally incompetent cops or agents. That's a common media trope, but it's generally not reflective of real life. Instead, this criminal was just particularly good at evading law enforcement. And it made sense, in retrospect, that the killer would turn out to be a former cop, someone who knew their methods and consequently knew how to stay off their radar and not get caught. At the same time, they were still able to work up a fairly detailed and accurate profile of the killer, even if they were unable to catch him. They knew his height and weight and shoe size, his level of strength and agility, his rough psychological profile. They also knew, from physical evidence that he'd left behind, that his blood type was A, his sperm did not contain any blood group antigens, and based on witness testimony, that he had smaller than average genitalia. But again, despite all that, and a great deal more that they knew about the man who had committed these crimes, and despite having several serious leads and suspects, they were never able to catch him. That is, until an investigator with the Contra Costa County District Attorney's Office and an FBI lawyer decided to work together and try something unusual and of somewhat dubious legality. Paul Holes, the investigator, had been working on this collection of cases for about 24 years, and he was getting close to retiring when he came up with an atypical approach to filtering through suspects that he thought might just work. His idea centered around using the many personal genomics services that have popped up over the past decade. You may have heard of companies like 23andMe and MyHeritageDNA. Those are the types of services that we're talking about here. You pay usually in the neighborhood of a hundred bucks to maybe a few hundred dollars, and they can then tell you things about your genetic makeup where your family comes from, what health risks you might face, and who else on their service you might be related to. I'll get more into the specifics of that a little bit later, but I will note here that these services are not mapping all 3 billion base pairs of your DNA sequence. That's something that's increasingly possible, and for a price that is becoming ever more reasonable. Around $1,000 is the number I've been seeing most commonly these days, though I've been told by folks in the field that closer to 2000 is still usually more realistic for the time being due to the associated costs beyond just turning on the equipment. But I'm also told that that number could be as low as about 100 bucks in a few years. But that is not what these services, 23andMe and their ilk, do. Those more expensive machines kind of unspool the entire genome and can present a complete map of your genetic structure. The cheaper, consumer-level, at-home, kit-based products like 23andMe, on the other hand, are more akin to big data companies. They take a look at the best science available, and when good research says, hey, if you look at this specific area in someone's genetic code, and if it looks like this, then their chance of contracting this particular genetic disease goes up by 20%. They are able to play similar games with genetic heritage, taking the data they have about all the people in their databases, which includes both folks who have bought their kits and people whose information is contained in other data sources that they have acquired through companies that exist solely to connect genetic data, which seems like a pretty weird business, but it's actually not that different in function from companies that collect market data for companies that want to sell you things. So they take all that data, they mash it together, and they're able to come up with fairly accurate predictions about your level of risk for things like heart and skin conditions, Alzheimer's, and a handful of other afflictions. They are FDA approved to do this type of predicting for around a dozen conditions at the moment, including a few genetic setups that predispose bearers to a higher risk of breast cancer. 
All of which is to say, there is genetic work being done here, but these companies are able to provide their services so cheaply, because they're actually mostly just looking in a few dozen specific places on the DNA, rather than mapping the entire thing. They then take those snippets and compare them against databases, which then tell them what each data nugget means for the person who has it, and they then inform the owner of that DNA about their possible predispositions, again based on big data, rather than a complete mapping of their genetics. And then importantly, they then add that person's data to their ever-growing database of genetic information. As a consequence, these stockpiles of data get bigger and bigger and more accurate the more people they have participating. But it's also an asymmetric approach to the field, and as such, they tend to be more about sharing and making personal knowledge that has already been discovered by the folks who are doing the actual genomic research. And in some cases, they're also cluing in those researchers as to where they might want to look next, based on what their big data stockpiles are saying. So they can say, our data indicates that 80% of people with this gene sequence have this condition, and scientists can then go explore that to test the hypothesis. But they don't generally do the gene research themselves. They are not that type of company. So this was the space that that investigator, Paul Holes, was betting on when he started traveling from police station to police station looking for usable DNA that he could feed into this burgeoning personal genomics space. He was betting on big data and its potential to tell him more about this murderer to provide him with the first fresh leads that they've had in decades. As it turned out, due to the age of the cases involved, most of the available genetic materials were useless. They hadn't been properly saved, or they had aged too badly to serve this purpose. But as luck would have it, a medical examiner in Ventura County had kept a duplicate of the DNA sample from a Golden State Killer murder case that had taken place 37 years ago, and he'd saved it and tucked it away and taken good care of it just in case. That sample was made available to the investigator, and after checking it against the genetic material information that was stored in the Combined DNA Index System, which is a federal database where they store genetic information from murder and rape cases, he submitted it to several personal genomic services, including one called GED Match, which is a free open source alternative to sites like 23andMe, where users can upload the genetic data that they acquire elsewhere, like 23andMe, and get additional results from a large alternative non-corporate owned network of people who are looking for insight into their genes and to connect with potential unknown family members. The investigator justified using the DNA in this way and justified claiming, when he signed up for the website, to be the owner of the genetic information he was submitting by saying that no court order was needed because this service was a pool of raw genetic profiles that people share publicly, openly, anyway, which would not have been the case with a corporate-owned data pool, but because this was open in this way, it was therefore available for this use case. The validity of that excuse aside, the information gleaned from using this site in this way allowed the investigator to track, through somewhat distant relatives and ancestors, a collection of potential suspects. Those suspects were then assessed for their correlation to what law enforcement already knew about the killer, including what he looked like and his expertise, but also their location. They were looking for people who would have been in these areas at the times that these crimes were committed, and who also fit within that rough family tree that they'd been able to map out using this service. Eventually, this information led the investigation to D'Angelo, and while staking him out, they were able to collect some DNA off something that he'd discarded, and they tested it against the DNA that belonged to the Golden State Killer, and it was a match. So part of this story is about how innovative uses of new consumer-grade citizen science-style technologies can be effective in filtering through this type of suspect pool, at least in some cases. Though I want to make clear here that a lot of information outside, beyond that genetic data, was required for that data to be useful in the first place. McNamara, that true crime author that I mentioned earlier, tried to do this exact same thing using the website Ancestry.com, but the one link that it provided was too distant to provide her with a lead. 
So lacking that more complete data and lacking the perhaps larger, perhaps just different database contained on GED Match, her attempt failed, while Investigator Hole's attempt led him to that next step. After he was arrested, D'Angelo, now 72 years old, was only charged with a total of 12 murders, as the majority of his crimes had aged past the statute of limitations. As of the day I'm recording this, sentencing hasn't yet been carried out, but it's likely to happen pretty soon. And seeing as how just four of the 12 murders he'd been charged with each individually carry the potential for the death penalty or life in prison, it's a good bet that he will either go on death row or spend the rest of his life in prison, which, at his age, may amount to the same thing either way. And also, as of the day I'm recording this, I was able to find reports on a half dozen other cold cases that have been reopened due to revelations gained using this same tactic, using personal genomics services as a means of reducing the pool of suspects, and then figuring out who within that sprawling family tree would have had the opportunity and motive to commit the crime, before then going on to test their DNA against the genetic information they already have about the perpetrator. For most people, I think it's safe to say, catching murderers and rapists seems like a pretty good thing. The controversy in this case, though, is not about the validity of catching murderers and rapists. The controversy here revolves around privacy, and particularly privacy when it comes to genetic information. A lot of people including those who run GED Match, which was the site that was eventually successfully used to find relatives of the person who matched the Golden State Killer's DNA, these people are not happy about how all of this played out. Like anyone else, they are no doubt thrilled to have a monster who evaded capture for so long off the streets, but they're also not super thrilled with the implied breach of trust on their site. The information there being used for purposes that would not occur to most people and which therefore might be considered to be shocking or invasive. The founder of GED Match provided the following statement to Ars Technica when they asked him about the matter. Quote, Although we were not approached by law enforcement or anyone else about this case or about the DNA, it has always been GED Match's policy to inform users that the database could be used for other uses, as set forth in the site policy. While the database was created for genealogical research, it is important that GED match participants understand the possible uses of their DNA, including information of relatives that have committed crimes or were victims of crimes. If you are concerned about non-genealogical uses of your DNA, you should not upload your DNA to the database and or you should remove DNA that has already been uploaded. End quote. Other companies with similar offerings presented their own this isn't how this service is meant to be used, style statements. A spokesperson for Ancestry.com said, quote, Ancestry advocates for its members' privacy and will not share any information with law enforcement unless compelled to by valid legal process, end quote. And a spokesperson for 23andMe said, quote, 23andMe has never given customer information to law enforcement officials. Our platform is only available to our customers and does not support the comparison of genetic data processed by any third party to genetic profiles within our database, end quote. In other words, there is a general scramble to reassure users and customers that their data is not being fed to the feds and by implication to potentially anyone else as well. But at the end of the day, this information is there. And even if this use of their services is off-label, is not what it was built to do, it's still doable, and it's being done. And I suspect, and this is a fairly broad suspicion, I think, that this and other cases like it, where this type of data is being used in this way, is just the harbinger of what's to come. This information is out there, and just like other aggregated information, it can be used and potentially abused by countless innovators and opportunists. In this way, this story runs right up against similar stories that are playing out in the world of social networks, where data collected about users, what you might call memetic instead of genetic data, is being harvested for purposes beyond what users ostensibly signed up for. And like in the case with Facebook, to name just one high-profile example, 
The companies involved in collecting and storing this data are towing the line between wanting to make full profitable use of the data that they have and ensuring users from whom they harvest the data that it's safe and there's nothing to worry about, even as examples of how that's not really the case begin to bubble to the surface. Genetic information, though, is notable even amongst other types of personal data that might be collected about an individual because of just how much information it contains. Consider what might happen if your genetic info was sucked up by some aggregator and that collection of data was then made available to a health insurance company. That health insurance company might be able to, in the background, without your knowledge, charge you more for insurance because it knows that you have a genetic predisposition for a certain expensive-to-treat type of cancer, something that perhaps you don't even know. This scenario seems a little science fiction-y, but it's a very valid concern, as it mirrors what's already happened with essentially every other type of data ever collected. But it's also somewhat terrifying, not just because these big faceless corporations and other organizations might conceivably know more about you than you do, but also because the science of making predictions based on genetic materials is still in its infancy. So it could be that they get it wrong, or that you do have that sort of predisposition, but because of lifestyle or pure dumb luck of the draw, that cancer never develops. And either way, insurance is theoretically meant to share the risk of these types of things happening between members of a society. So if that organizing body behind spreading that risk has an informational advantage and hikes prices accordingly, it rewires the entire insurance industry. Suddenly the profit motive is far more pressing and the folks on the other end who are buying into the insurance scheme are more likely to get less than what they're paying for. It breaks the whole system. Now, there are laws meant to combat this possibility all over the world. Here in the U.S., we have the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, which says, in essence, that you can't use genetic information to discriminate when it comes to selling health insurance or employing someone. But acts like this have a way of disappearing or being amended into uselessness when having them do so is practical for powerful people. There's a proposed act on the docket right now, in fact, called H.R. 1313, otherwise known as the Preserving Employee Wellness Programs Act, which would allow employers to demand workers' genetic test results and punish employees who refused to provide them, under the guise of this being a good thing because it allows employers to reward people who wear fitness trackers and who make healthy dietary and exercise decisions. So even though there are some very cool potential innovations on the horizon in this space, like personalized medicine based on our genetic information, there are also a large number of potential downsides, including genetic discrimination and industry manipulation. There's also the chance that we might see more social discrimination based on genetic information, like the predisposition for certain conditions or genetic heritage or who knows what else. We humans really like to tribe up, so it's almost certain that some stupid thing that we don't know about yet will be leveraged by someone to create a new in-group and out-group organizational method. Think about how we treat each other today because of the fuzzy concept of race, and you have a pretty good idea of what genetic prejudice could look like in practice. It's worth remembering that there are plenty of amazing, truly beneficial possibilities inherent in this type of research and these sorts of programs. I've personally used 23andMe, and though not life-changing, it was interesting to read up on some of what I may have written into my genetic code and where my genes may have initially developed. And the possibilities here that are on the horizon are pretty epic. Personalized medicine, the ability to develop genetically specific treatments for people. That alone could be worth the cost of entry into this space. We've still got a long way to go before we can alter ourselves on the fly with CRISPR-Cas9 or some similar futuristic version of the same, but even the short-term version of this sort of knowledge can help us plan for and potentially prevent the worst possible health outcomes that would otherwise catch us flat-footed. And it may even help us if we are all acting totally rationally, so maybe don't hold your breath on this one, to recognize just how similar we are, despite the countless interesting differences that we see when we look at each other 
we might be able to better comprehend at a fundamental level just how similar we are beneath the surface. All of this innovation could cause humanity to split into separate species based on economic status because wealthy families would be able to afford high-end designer babies with perfect health and a higher ceiling for things like intelligence and strength while it would remain just the luck of the draw for the rest of us. But these technologies and techniques could also be used to weed immensely detrimental, agonizing diseases out of the gene pool completely for everyone. It could be one of the most widely beneficial technological paths we've ever had the chance to follow. For every violation of genetic privacy, there is a serial killer captured. For every cured disease, there's a potential dystopian world ruled by a genetically modified human subspecies. The more impressive and interesting and rich with potential a technology might be, the bigger the threat it poses. It's important to remember that dichotomous nature of our tools, whether our initial inclination is to curse them or celebrate them. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash let's note things. It's also possible to contribute via PayPal and Venmo and services of that nature. You can find more about that at letsnotethings.com. And also super helpful is leaving a quick review wherever you get your podcasts. And as I mentioned in the intro, I will be going on tour soon. You can find out more about that and you can snag tickets to events if you'll be in the area and would like to come say hello at becomingtour.com. The book that I would like to recommend today is called On Grand Strategy by John Lewis Gaddis. This was a really compelling read on a couple different levels. First, it's just chock full of very interesting stories from a bunch of different cultures and a bunch of different time periods throughout history. But it's also fascinating in the way that books like The Art of War are fascinating, in that they give you kind of little strategic lessons that are shown through these stories. But unlike The Art of War, most of the stories and the lessons in this book, they're less about fighting, less about how to defeat an enemy on the battlefield, and more about statecraft, more about diplomacy. And in some cases, there are militaries involved. I mean, this is human history after all, but what's focused on is not how to position your troops and things like that. It's how the different leaders responded to each other, how they implemented broad, grand strategies over time, and things that tend to work and not work in different types of situations. And as tends to be the case with those types of lessons, having them explored and demonstrated through well-told stories tends to help those lessons stick a whole lot better than just presenting them as a dry recitation of bullet points and names and dates. So if any of that sounds at all interesting and you're looking for a good, dense read, On Grand Strategy by John Lewis Gaddis is worth picking up. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes for this episode and every episode at letsnotethings.com. You can check out my blog at exilelifestyle.com, and you can get tickets for my upcoming tour at becomingtour.com. Feel free to reach out and say hello on social media. I am at Colin is my name pretty much everywhere. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you.